Welcome to the ACOM seminar. Today's speaker is Ben Black. Uh, ben got his bachelor's degree in earth and planetary sciences at Harvard. And then he got an MFA in creative writing at NYU. And then right after that, he, he got a Fulbright and went to Iceland to do research. Um, and then his PhD at MIT in earth, atmospheric, and planetary sciences. He's um, interested in the Earth and, and other planets. Uh, he, he won the Lewis and Clark Field Scholar for Astrobiology, um, among uh, uh, also the President's Fellowship at MIT, um, and the MIT EAPS Award for Excellence in Teaching. And now he's a um, professor at uh, the City College of New York, and he's going to tell us about ancient massive eruptions and what they do to our chemistry and climate. <clears throat> Thanks, everyone. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I'm going to, as Mike said, I'm going to be talking about how ancient massive volcanic eruptions can serve as kind of large-scale experiments uh, in Earth's climate and chemistry. So the first thing I wanted to do is I wanted to acknowledge um, my collaborators. I feel really lucky to have gotten to work with such a fantastic group of colleagues. Um, so all, all the people listed here and many probably who are not have contributed to different parts of what I'm going to be talking about. I mentioned that I was going to be thinking of volcanoes in some sense as experiments. And what I mean by that is that uh, volcanoes can differ from each other really dramatically in terms of uh, mass, but also duration and emissions. So this is um, a plot of mass, a log-log plot of mass versus duration. Uh, with just some sort of more familiar examples plotted on there to get you oriented. Mount Pinatubo is off there. On the left, um, it's a brief large explosive eruption. Uh, there are larger explosive eruptions like Toba there, a couple of orders of magnitude bigger. Um, and then over here, you get into more uncharted territory. And um, the, the idea is really, if we're thinking of these ex experiments, how do changes in these different basic uh, aspects of a volcanic eruption modulate the, the climate and chemistry consequences? And this diagram, in some sense, it can serve as a, a roadmap for where I'm going to go during t our time together today. So we're going to start out uh, thinking about Toba briefly and then veer off here towards uh, larger mass, but also longer duration, basaltic fissure eruptions known as flood basalts. <clears throat> so these kinds of eruptions are less frequent even than something like Mount Pinatubo. Um, we haven't witnessed eruptions like this in the common era, and I think it's fair to say that um, for some of these eruptions at least, it's not clear that humans will ever witness something like this within the span of human beings as a species. So it seems then, I think it's a fair question to ask, why should we care about eruptions like this and their consequences um, when we may never see something like this? Why does it matter? Um, so reasons to care include, well, I think it's just really cool. That it, intrinsically, these are some of the most wild uh, climate and chemistry experiments that have taken place on our planet. Um, there's also, um, in some cases, controversial and in some cases fairly well established uh, connections with events like mass extinctions or, uh, and this is the controversial part, there's this idea that's been out there about a link with uh, human evolution in the case of Toba. And for both of those reasons, because of the nature of these 
natural experiments and also because of some of the environmental data that's out there on their consequences, I think they can serve as useful benchmarks or touchstones for what we could expect or what we could be cautious about from current and future climate change. Um, so let's talk now about Toba to begin with. Toba was the largest volcanic eruption of the past million years, um, volume of around 2,800 cubic kilometers. And uh, so the, it, I mentioned that um, there's this idea that's out there that it caused a severe decrease in human population. Jason English has done some microphysical simulations using karma. Um, that's what's on the left here. Uh, zonal mean and the colors indicate AOD. And so after about a year, you have an optical depth of around uh, four. And using the MPI model, Claudia Timrick has looked at this and predicted around three to four degrees of global mean cooling at peak. And the interesting the twist to all of this is that when you look at independent records, for example, of temperature changes uh, during and after this event, and also what's happening with human uh, populations, they don't entirely seem to mesh. Uh, so the temperature record suggests that if there was cooling, it was not as severe as even three to four degrees C. And so this is a figure from uh, a nature paper that just came out a few months ago by Smith et al. And really, it's just a map. But this is where they've done some archaeological excavations. And what they find is that they've, they're able, able to identify the Toba tephra. So they know exactly where the eruption is. And then they can look at, well, what's going on with uh, mo anatomically modern humans in this location at this time. And the conclusion is that they, they don't see any uh, decrease and potentially even an increase in the kinds of finds that they're making above and below this horizon. So it doesn't totally mess up, mesh up. And uh, one question that you could ask is then, well, is there a, a regional climate response that can reconcile what we expect from an eruption of this size? We know that the eruption happened. Um, what we expect from an eruption of this size and what's predicted by the models uh, with the records from Africa. <clears throat> so this is a project that we're just uh, getting started on, but uh, the idea is to use, uh, to do a large ensemble with Wacom and Karma. And this is work that uh, Jean-Francois Lamarck is leading and uh, a number of others in this room are involved. Um, these, uh, this is just a first glimpse of results from one run, uh, zonal mean, surface temperature anomaly. Um, and there's pretty severe cooling, especially in the northern hemisphere in this simulation of uh, up to around 10 degrees in the northern hemisphere mid-latitudes. Can you remind us the latitude of this volcano? On yeah, so Toba is equ equatorial. It's maybe a little bit, um, I think, north of the equator, but just a couple of degrees. So wouldn't we expect to cool most of the equator? Yeah, well, so... Uh, if you look, if you remember from uh, Jason's uh, simulations, the AOD was pretty evenly spread, um, northern and southern hemisphere. So we'll see what happens, I guess, if we vary the time of year of the eruption. But we haven't looked at that yet. Yeah. I, someone once told me that the sooner someone interrupts the speaker, the better the talk is. So <laughs> go, go for it. Seriously, you're helping me. Um, uh, so that's just really an initial snapshot of where that project might head. Um, and I think it'll be interesting to see it's an eruption that happened just to quantify what the consequences of an event like that might be. Um, but in some sense, Toba, um, there are some microphysical differences. There might be differences in terms of the aerosol size distribution, the settling, um, and the aerosol lifetime. But it is kind of in line with Mount Pinatubo uh, in that it's a brief, large injection of sulfur to the stratosphere. Whereas um, as you get off here, 
things start to get uh, potentially quite a bit different even from something like Toba. Um, so what I'm talking about here are flood basalts, which are a, a cousin in some ways of um, fissure eruptions like you have in Iceland or Hawaii. Um, and so you might tend to think of eruptions like this as having regional rather than global kinds of consequences. But I would argue that that's a misconception uh, just because of the intensity of some of the, these are, what's, what's plotted here is really, say, an episode within a flood basalt province, is what I'll talk about. Um, but the intensity of some of the, these most intense periods during flood basalt magmatism puts them in a, bit, a, a different league than something like Iceland or Kilauea. So just to give you a picture, in case you don't have a picture in your head of what I'm talking about when I say basaltic fissure eruption, this is an image from uh, the Hulufrain eruption uh, in Iceland in 2014 and 2015. Um, and so it's a, sort of a linear series of vents, fire fountaining, um, and uh, you can actually see the sulfur emissions, which is kind of cool. But of course, scaled up by multiple orders of magnitude. Um, so in fact, the volume of typical flood basalt provinces is on the order of 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 7 cubic kilometers of magma. Also, the most recent one uh, was the Columbia River flood basalts, kind of a, a smaller one, 16 and a half million years ago. So that goes really, they're not common events, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, the, the, uh, the most prevalent idea for how you form a flood basalt province is that um, they mark the arrival of something called a mantle plume at the base of the lithosphere. And when this mantle plume first arrives, uh, you have this period of intense magma generation. So this is just a, a classic, figures from a classic paper, so you can read down in the left column and then down on the right column, but just the arrival of a plume. And then it has a head, uh, and that's the flood basalt province. And then the idea is that that long tail forms more subdued uh, magmatism, melt generation, like you see at a place like Hawaii, right, where you have the Hawaiian uh, emperor seamount chain. So how, how, do they, how high do they get material? From the yeah, ocean? so... Uh, it depends on the mass flux that controls the buoyancy flux and the column height, but um, a reasonable estimate might be during the most intense episodes of magmatism, you could get to around 18 kilometers. Um, so depending on what latitude you're erupting at, uh, somewhere right around the upper troposphere, lower stratosphere. But that would be hard to sustain. But if you wanted to get material to, say, 10 to 14 kilometers, so you could do that for more sustained periods. Yeah. And so that's based on uh, plume modeling by Lori Glaze and Steve Self and Anya Schmidt. <clears throat> so uh, this is, you remember I mentioned that the most recent eruption of this flavor happened around 16 million years ago. So Especially, you might be wondering why we should care about events like this, but they are important. Uh, another reason that they matter uh, comes from diagrams like this. This is a, I kind of like it when you get to see an old diagram that has this, looks like somebody's drawn it with a pen, because you know them, that it's a classic. So this is a classic uh, diagram. On the y-axis is the number of marine families. And then on the x-axis, we're going back around 600 million years in time through the present. Um, so there's the Cambrian radiation. And then you notice these divots. And those divots are uh, what we now know as mass extinctions. So the most recent one is the end Cretaceous mass extinction. That's the one uh, where the dinosaurs vanished. Um, and then there's this really large divot here, number three, which is the end Permian mass extinction, the largest 
loss of floral and faunal diversity in Earth's history, uh, around 95% of uh, marine species. <clears throat> so probably many of you know this story, maybe all of you, um, but I like to tell it anyway, because it's kind of a classic. Um, so 30 years ago now, I guess, 30, more than 30 years ago, uh, there was the classic paper by Alvarez, uh, first describing these sections at Gubbio with an iridium anomaly. And the hypothesis that this end Cretaceous, end Cretaceous mass extinction was caused by a asteroid impact. And uh, I think the first smoking gun for this really was the discovery of the crater at Chicxulub. And you can see also uh, work by Brian Toon and some of the people in this room uh, looking at the consequences of this. But for now, I'll just suggest that you imagine after this discovery that the global hunt was on for the other impact craters that corresponded with the other mass extinctions. Um, but instead of finding more impact events, what began to emerge was a different pattern. Um, this is also uh, an old, old figure. What's being plotted here are the ages of mass extinctions and ocean anoxic events on the y-axis and the ages of flood basalt provinces on the x-axis. So as the geochronology has continued to get better and better, in a number of cases, uh, this temporal link has gotten tighter and tighter. Um, so for example, for the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province and the N-Triassic mass extinction, the Siberian Traps, and the N-Permian mass extinction, to the point where I, I think it's very fair to say that there's broad community consensus that for some of these events, not all of them, uh, flood basalt provinces, there's some link with these mass extinctions. There's a causal relationship. Um, but the nature of that causal relationship is re still a really open question, how that link might operate, which makes it a fun, really rich thing to work on. It's fun for me. Um, and uh, hopefully it will be fun for you for the next few minutes. I'm going to talk about uh, looking at a few different uh, mechanisms that <coughs> might be possible and evaluating them on a case-by-case -case basis. Before I do that, I, I want to give you just a little bit more background uh, on flood basalts, a little more geology, basically, to bring us all up to speed in terms of emissions and how we know what I'm going to sort of use as inputs to simulations. <clears throat> so flood basalt provinces, like any volcanoes, they have a life cycle and they have actually a lifetime. Uh, so over the course of 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 6 years, uh, a large flood basalt province will in place on the order of 10 to the 6 or perhaps 10 to the 7 cubic kilometers of magma at the Earth's surface and uh, intrusively, so beneath the surface. And uh, so just to give you an, one handle, one perspective on that kind of amount of material, because it's a lot hard to visualize, that's enough to cover the continental United States and around a few hundred meters to perhaps a, a kilometer of magma. So it's a lot, but that what we think is that this is not all in place sort of steadily, because if you divide a lot by a million years, then the flux is actually not too remarkable. Uh, but rather, the evidence suggests that you have uh, periods of more intense magmatism separated by periods with less, lower levels of activity. And this comes from uh, basically the lines of evidence that I've listed here. I'm happy to talk more about these if you're uh, curious. So, yeah. <clears throat> I think this is going to. This is a movie. This is drone footage. It's not my drone footage. I wish that it were my drone footage. Uh, but this is footage uh, from the USGS of the Kilauea eruption that's happening right now. Um, so this is uh, 
there's the vent and there's this lava channel and uh, then it's flowing out to the sea. And I think, well, it's just, it's, I've watched this video maybe like nine, 11, possibly 11 times so far, and it's just fun to watch, but also I think another useful reference point uh, in terms of thinking about both how we could visualize something like this, but how it's also really different. Because you you see those emissions, I think at some point some of them might have gotten, uh, some of the sulfur might have gotten detected in the stratosphere, but it's not really very high level um, emissions. So, uh, that's, this is the volume of Kilauea so far. And actually, so the, just because of the way PowerPoint plots these shapes, there's a red outline around that shape, but it's really the white pixel, if you can see it, in the middle there that I'm talking about. Since 1980. No, so this is basically the, since this current episode. Yeah. Um, and here's Toba, around 2,800 cubic kilometers. And then I talked about flood basalts the tempo being something like where you have episodes of heightened activity that might span a decade to a century or a couple of centuries. And so the volume of something like that might be on the order of 10 to the 4 cubic kilometers. And then you assemble many of those into the overall province. One important thing to remember here, which uh, hopefully we'll drive home in the next few slides, is that this is volume. It doesn't necessarily scale with emissions directly. we can't just assume that bigger is more. Um, so Do I'm going, any, yeah. Is there any other information to help you with the scaling? Um, Kilauea and, and the eruptions on Hawaii have a different vis- viscosity to the flows and therefore the outgassing. Then you see at other volcanic eruptions yeah. on Earth. Is there evidence that something like the Columbia River or the Siberian Traps are similar to Kilauea or are they their own different beasts? Yeah, well, I think that in terms of the initial volatile concentrations, there's evidence to suggest that maybe they're fairly similar. But then I think, as you'll see, they're really different beasts in a number of other ways, Um, partly in terms of the potential for interaction with some of the uh, surrounding country rocks. There's just more heat. So we'll talk about that. Um, But... I'm trying to remember. I think there was one more thing that um, right, so all I just wanted to say, so we can't directly just go from volume to emissions, uh, and that's kind of nice because one of my favorite questions uh, and something that I spend a lot of time and effort on is actually trying to figure out trying to quantify what actually is released from eruptions like this and from a range of different kinds of eruptions. So I'm going to force you to listen to a few slides about that, how we understand this. And I think it's hopefully will be uh, useful also because uh, we talk about estimates, for example, the petrologic method, if you've heard that phrase for sulfur release, and this is what we're talking about. So um, the petrologic method is looking at things called melt inclusions, which are, this is a photo uh, micrograph of a melt inclusion, um, but it's really just a tiny, tiny droplet of trapped melt. In reality, the diameter of that thing is about the diameter of a human hair. And so it's trapped inside a crystal, and that forms a time capsule, really. So it tells us about the concentrations of things like sulfur that were dissolved in the melt before an eruption happened, before there was uh, degassing. So that's pretty good for sulfur. Uh, We can do this, and we have done this, for uh, melt inclusions inside crystals from lavas from places like the Siberian Traps or the Deccan Traps. Um, The challenge is that it doesn't work so well for everything as it does for sulfur. Uh, Sulfur doesn't start to form bubbles until pretty shallow in the magmatic system, whereas CO2 is prone to form bubbles really deep Uh, in a magmatic system. So if you look at that diagram on the left there, if you're saturated in CO2, say, at the base of the crust, but you actually trap your melt inclusion uh, in the middle or upper crust, then you're not going to have a record of what you started out with. You're just going to have a record of what you had left over. Um, So it forms, in some sense, a lower limit. Uh, 
So the estimates that we have for how much CO2 might be released from flood basalts and uh, range from on the order of a half a weight percent to around a weight percent CO2. And those are just based on comparison with active volcanoes like Kilauea or um, Iceland. And we've started, the, there were for a long time no direct measurements um, from flood basalts. Uh, we now have some measurements from melt inclusions. And perhaps not surprisingly, they're much lower even than those canonical estimates of flood basalt carbon uh, because uh, probably these melt occlusions have partially lost their CO2. But there are other, uh, and this starts to get into pretty hardcore geochemistry, but there's other lines of evidence that some of these magmas may have had significantly more CO2. Uh, so this is from trace elements. And this is just actually that second bar is kind of a nice one because it's how much uh, CO2 would it take to make some, some of the Columbia River magmas buoyant relative to the rocks that they had to erupt through. So they had to be less dense than what they're erupting through in order to actually get out. Um, <clears throat> so hints of more CO2. The reason this question I think is really pressing uh, we'd like to understand how much CO2 was in the magma much better than we do, is because there's a lot, really a wealth of independent proxy evidence from some of these events, like the end Permian mass extinction on the left, the end Triassic mass, mass extinction, the Paleocene, Eocene thermal maximum, that CO2, that carbon cycle perturbation was really fundamental to what was going on during these events. And the other thing is that the geochronology has gotten better to, and better. So carbon perturbation is central, and these events coincide with flood basalt eruption. So we'd like to understand how that's happening, uh, just to, so I don't just show you this and then make you take my word for it. I'll tell you what actually these figures are. Uh, so on the left, that's the end Permian. That's uh, temperature from oxygen isotopes. Time is on the y-axis there, so you see about a 10 degrees of warming of sea surface temperature uh, coupled with a carbon isotope excursion. In the middle, this is maybe the most intuitive. This is a PCO2 proxy from pedogenic carbonates from the Newark Basin, so uh, close to where I live, which is I like. Um, and these three blue lines are three pulses of um, magmatism that took place. So across each of those pulses, there was a big jump uh, in PCO2 according to these proxies. Um, this one, I think, is a couple thousand ppm. So that's pr pretty direct evidence that the individual pulses of flood basalt magmatism can directly affect atmospheric CO2. And then this is the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum carbon isotopes <coughs> coupled with a uh, pulse of ocean acidification. <clears throat> the challenge is that if you think back to those canonical estimates of how much CO2 the magmas we think they have, it doesn't seem like they have enough. Um, so this is kind of that disconnect is what, what I'm really excited about right now, trying to figure out what's going on. Uh, but this figure basically says we don't understand what's going on. Because on the x-axis, this is the PCO2 change that you'd expect for a given uh, magma volume on the y-axis um, and a given CO2 concentration in that magma volume, uh, those, those contours. And so that blue shaded box, that's one of those N-triassic PCO2 increases. This is all based on scaling. Uh, I can talk about that with you if you like. like but um, the basic idea is if you look at those canonical CO2 concentrations in the magma half a weight percent to a weight percent, you're not getting over uh, even for very large magma volumes to this kind of PCO2 increase. So you'd like to understand what, what's going on. Um, another idea for what could be going on here, well, there's abundant evidence from sudden flood basalt provinces for interaction with the sedimentary country rocks. The, these magmas, there's a lot, huge volume, which means a lot of heat. They're basaltic, so they're hotter and they heat the country rocks. And in some places, those country rocks can have things like hydrocarbons. Uh, so this is where we're starting to get to the chemistry. Um, 
those things can have some hydrocarbons, but also halogens. And as you heat them, you can start to generate uh, compounds that you would not ordinarily expect uh, from volcanism, things like methyl chloride. Um, so this image is this is a mine in Siberia. Uh, I spent I spent a lot of months in Siberia. Actually, I didn't get to see this, but I've seen things like it. And um, so th at the center of this mine, there's a pipe that roots uh, in a basaltic sill. And the idea here is that you have a sill, it intrudes hydrocarbon source rocks, uh, heats them to the point where there's an explosion, and uh, you vent gases, and you form this pipe-like structure. And for some reason, that there's also some iron ore that's good for mining that forms in there as well, possibly due to hydrothermal uh, effects afterwards. So this is another source of maybe more emissions, but also different kinds of gases than you usually expect, which makes it, I think, really the, the place this all takes us is that uh, we have to think about a lot more things, a lot more kinds of emissions than just sulfur. And I'm, I'm really sensitive to, I don't want to say, we don't have to worry about CO2 from individual historic eruptions. I, I don't want to give the impression that I'm saying that. So, but rather I'm saying that this is a really different kind of volcanic eruption where uh, it seems we really do have to think about the consequences of CO2. Uh, and also things like halogens and organohalogens, uh, you could also generate a lot of methane uh, from heating of these country rocks. Um, that's, these are estimates, for example, based on heating experiments that people have done. They just heated these uh, rocks and seen what comes out. Um, so, and also trace metal and nutrient fluxes to the oceans. So I'll come back to that. Can I just interrupt yeah. for one stupid mm -hmm. question? Sure. So do we see any evidence of CO2 coming out of the Hawaiian volcano? Uh, I don't know if people are using, I really hope that, peop, that the USGS has multi-gas sensors there and they're looking at CO2. Um, I haven't seen any data that's flowing out. But I, so for example, from uh, Holothrain, uh, you mind if I scroll back? It's kind of annoying. When it, so for, uh, that left bar from Holothrain, uh, that's from uh, multi-gas sensor from that 2014-2015 eruption that actually it's only an EGU abstract that I found but there was really high ratios of carbon to sulfur right at the beginning of that eruption in the plume that was coming out. So I don't know if that is that um, but I think it's it's there's less data than we have, for example, for sulfur. Sure. Yeah. Um, OK, so th uh, the next thing I'd like to do is just go through a few examples of what we tried to do to look at each of these things. Um, so one of the first things we looked at was the effects of things like methyl chloride um, on ozone. And the reason we looked at this is because um, there had been previous work uh, suggesting that this process might have taken place. Um, and so we used a range of publish, em, published emission estimates and uh, CAMCAM to look at what would happen. Um, and so this is one of the, the simpler scenarios where we're just putting a large flux of methyl chloride um, and methane into the base of the troposphere. And so unlike uh, volcanic HCL, where you, it's not clear how much of that might reach the stratosphere versus get scrubbed out of the plume, um, methyl chloride, uh, the lifetime in the troposphere is long enough that if you put it into the base of the troposphere in the top panel, um, it then mixes up into the stratosphere, uh, where in the second panel it leads to increases in the chlorine mixing ratio, and in the bottom panel it leads to uh, a sharp decrease in global mean ozone column. And uh, then within a couple of years after you 
and the emissions, that's that black line, uh, ozone starts to recover. One of the cool things uh, that happened is that a few years after we, we wrote that paper, uh, a graduate student at UC Berkeley named Jeff Banka uh, started to really torture uh, these tiny little conifer plants with really high levels of ultraviolet radiation, sort of in line with the scenarios that we were predicting um, in some of these simulations. And what he found is that as a result of that higher UV, these stressed out conifers uh, would produce pollen morphologies um, on the bottom that, in, that really resemble some of these malformed pollen grains that people were finding all over the place that were really abundant from the end Permian. So kind of a neat thing that we're, we're talking about things that may ha or may not have happened 252 million years ago. So for me, it's really exciting when there's these signs that maybe this was a process that can explain some of the observations. Um, but at the same time, probably cannot help us to understand something like mass extinction in the ocean. So let's now talk about uh, sulfur and CO2. Um, so there has been some work uh, done on flood basalt sulfur. This is from a paper by Anya Schmidt and co-authors. Um, and so this is a nice, uh, she did some microphysical modeling, I think using GLOMAP. And what she found is that even though the emissions might just only reach the upper troposphere, uh, so they have shorter lifetimes than something, than sulfur injected into the stratosphere, because if you have sustained emissions, which is what you expect for something like a flood basalt as opposed to something like a Pinatubo, then uh, you can still have really significant climate effects. So I think that these emissions were something maybe 14 to 18 kilometers for something around 21 degrees south. I think the, the tropopause in, these, in her simulations was uh, something like 20 kilometers, if I remember correctly. Um, but the temperature calculation here uh, is being done offline, the climate response. So what we did um, is we used karma to look at the evolution of the aerosol size distribution. Um, and then this is uh, really Ryan Neely's uh, work where he calculated the from the 40 uh, radius and size distribution, uh, the mass and size distribution information. He calculated the optical properties, and then we fed that in uh, to longer, fully coupled simulations. Um, and we had uh, latest Permian paleogeography. And the question that we're trying to answer, even though they're longer simulations, we can't span, say, a million years of magmatism. And I don't think that we have to, because I think if, if you have a hiatus of, say, a few millennia, it's not going to be at least from the perspective of sulfur, there's probably not memory there, so it's not a cumulative effect. So you can look at just the most intense uh, episodes and try and understand the consequences of those. So that's what we're trying to do. <clears throat> um, I'll show you some of the proxy data that's out there. Uh, I know that this is a lot on this figure, but I kind of love looking at it because just rem remind yourself staring at this what this is this is the information that we have for what happened 252 million years ago i should mention i'm focusing in on one of these flood basalt provinces the siberian traps 252 million years ago which overlapped in time with the end permian mass extinction and, um, you have to sort of choose if you're going to do a simulation with paleogeography and so this is time uh starting 252.4 million years ago and going uh, a million and a half years later. And right in this blue box, right there, 
around 95% of marine species vanish forever. So just in that short interval. And across that interval, you have uh, strong warming and sea surface temperatures on that leftmost column. There's also a shift in strontium isotopes, which most people interpret um, as an increase in continental weathering. There's this sharp negative carbon isotope excursion. And then these uranium isotope records are generally interpreted as evidence that you have a, an expansion of anoxia across the boundary, uh, and also a sharp pulse of ocean acidification. The uranium isotopes, it's, inter- the, it's kind of hard to see because of the error bars, actually, but um, it's interesting. The, those have variously been interpreted as either uh, there's a shift or maybe some structure in there, some fluctuations in that record. And this is just a map of the world 252 million years ago with the locations of those proxy records on there. And the Siberian traps were around 60 north at this time. So a high latitude eruption, which means that um, the aerosols largely in our simulations remain in the northern hemisphere. Um, This is with around 2,000 teragrams per year SO2, uh, just steadily in karma. And uh, an optical depth, we reach an optical depth of almost five. Um, yeah. It's possible that you would have more transport to the southern hemisphere if there was aerosol heating in these simulations. But um, yeah. So uh, then these are on the bottom, really, the, these idealized scenarios that we're looking at. So model time. And then we're looking at, in blue, just if you just step change uh, CO2. And then in black, if you add on top of that uh, periods of around 200 years of sulfur emissions. (coughs) And we look at these sort of separately and then together, because there is some uncertainty in terms of how synchronized uh, these emissions are and what the right ratio is. And the pCO2 that we're choosing is motivated really by the proxy records of what the CO2 levels were during this time, rather than emissions, because the emissions are still fairly uncertain. Um, So what we see is, just on a global mean perspective, the top panel, that's the surface temperature anomaly relative to a baseline. And then there's this uh, strong response in terms of ocean circulation. Uh, that's the strength of the meridional overturning circulation and sphere drops. Um, so black, the black lines are when you have sulfur, blue lines again. It's just changes in CO2. And so that was maybe, the, that middle panel is maybe a little uh, surprising, but in general the picture here is that on longer time scales uh, you have some response to the greenhouse gases, and then on the shorter time scales you can have uh, a response where sulfur dominates. So and that, are you yeah. going to say anything about the ocean? Circuit? I'm going to come back to that on the next slide, but uh, yes, so I will come back to it. But maybe we, I was hoping to finish early, and I, I would like to Sorry. have some discussion. Like, so maybe I'll pause on that slide, and we can talk about it. Um, uh, so that response in terms of surface temperature uh, also translates into, so that's temperature anomaly on the first slide, uh, first row, sorry. And then for sort of means for, on this previous plot, I've marked where these are snapshots from. So during uh, one of these sulfur episodes and then sort of just capturing the longer term carbon response. So cooling, warming, there's an interesting warm patch there in the northern Panthalassa. Um, And then the, Color scale here here tells you about precipitation anomaly. So maybe not surprising, but the hydrological cycle is coupled with surface temperatures. So when you have a sulfur-dominated climate, you tend to spin down the hydrological cycle, so more brown. And a carbon-dominated climate, you tend to spin it up, so uh, more green. So now to come back to ocean circulation, Um, we see this strong response, um, I think maybe stronger than I expected. And I know that, so in models that have looked at smaller perturbations in terms of sulfur, there is a similar 
uh, response in terms of ocean circulation and in terms uh, to both PCO2 and sulfur. Um, so I think Stenchikov has looked at uh, the response to sulfur, and there's also some, I think it's a pretty common feature of models that as you increase PCO2, the ocean circulation vigor decreases. Um, but this is a much stronger response than to those uh, brief explosive volcanic eruptions, which it doesn't happen right away, and I think it is partly due to changes in runoff and partly just due to you're gradually, you have sustained emissions and you have more time to cool down uh, the surface ocean. So you're changing the surface water density. But um, this is something that I'm, I would be really interested to talk about with people if you have <coughs> ideas uh, or things to look at. So the, the picture that then emerges is something <coughs> along these lines, where the longer term picture is one in which you're dominated if you have en enormous changes in PCO2, that dominates. But with punctuated uh, intervals where if you have these pulses of intense sulfur release, those can switch you over temporarily into this cooler, uh, less hydrologically vigorous, stronger overturning state. And part of the point of this figure is that this is entirely a prediction because the resolution of the proxy records, the maximum resolution that we have is around 10 to the 4 years. Um, so we don't expect to see. That's, so what we might expect to see is something like that dashed line in a proxy record. So you don't really see these sulfur signatures. Um, so as a prediction, if we get higher resolution records, then we expect to see these swings between a sulfur and, or, and carbon mode. And if we don't see that, that's kind of interesting as well. It would suggest uh, either there's less sulfur being delivered to the stratosphere than we think, or uh, maybe there's something else going on that we don't understand about flood basalt outgassing. We can still, I think, make more sense of the long-term proxy record, which is what this really is. So for example, the shift in surface temperatures um, and how that might lead to more continental weathering due to a, a longer term uh, spin up of the hydrological cycle. <clears throat> so the last example that I wanted to give does not, it's not directly atmospheric chemistry, but it is still chemistry. So in addition to the gases that are released to the atmosphere, uh, when lavas flow into the ocean, this is another image from Kilauea, there's also the potential for a chemical exchange to take place at that interface. Um, and we'd like to understand, well, what are the fluxes of elements like iron or phosphorus or also trace metals? Um, Dan Rothman at MIT has suggested that there's uh, a sudden change in the nickel availability at this time. So we'd like to understand how, if that nickel is coming from the Siberian traps, and how could it actually get out. Uh, so what we did is we went and did a different kind of uh, large-scale experiment. Um, and I have under controlled conditions in quotes because uh, you'll see, but also what we're changing now is seawater chemistry. So we're going to, um, this is the lava furnace at Syracuse, and what we did is, okay, so there's me um, and my student Andres, and so we're taking this thing, and there's seawater in those buckets, and we know what the pH is, and we're going to bury that, and then we're just going to carry it over to this furnace, and I think this is the first time I did that, and you're standing in there, they're shouting, it's coming, it's coming, but you can't see when that lava is going to come. And uh, there's, the sound is really loud. It's like the sound of uh, Fisher. And then the, when that lava starts to come into the bucket, the feeling of it, as it hits the water, the, that metal rack starts to shake in your hand. And then now I went over to look in the buckets, and there's this intense 
briny smell, uh, the vaporizing seawater. So uh, the pretty, I think this almost, it's a simple idea, which is just to look, what we've done is we've put basalt into that furnace. We've heated it up to around 1,500 to 1,700 degrees Celsius. We've turned it back into lava. Um, and then some of it is going to quench there without going into water. We're going to measure the composition of that. We're going to measure the composition of these things, which are really extremely ugly rocks uh, that we've made um, from our buckets directly after we've done this experiment. And then we're going to keep uh, some of these rocks in basically just jars in contact with seawater, measure it after uh, as many months as we can stand to see how, see how the chemistry is changing and then just by mass balance infer what you might be uh, imparting to the ocean. And so the goal... Are you doing this with distilled water as well? So we've done it with... We haven't done it with distilled water. We might... We, might, we did it with some with tap water, some with... Uh, so one of my students actually went to... I think the the Rockaways or something, and got a whole bunch of buckets of seawater, and then we dragged it up to Syracuse, um, and we're doing it also with tap water that we're just putting salt and um, and changing the pH. And the f first way we tried to change the pH was by uh, carbonating it with a soda stream, but that didn't really work. Uh, so now we're using pool salts, um, but. Yeah, the goal here, which we haven't gotten to yet, we haven't done any modeling yet, is to first determine these fluxes, then try and assess the implications for ocean chemistry um, and also productivity if you're releasing nutrients like iron. Um, so, yeah, just to bring it back then to where I started, I said that these kinds of experiments could uh, potentially give us some perspective on current and future climate change. And one way in which that's possible is to think about, so now this is just time uh, from the year 2000 to the uh, year 2200. And looking at these, I think maybe some of these representative concentration pathways I might have drawn a bit wrong. But in any case, the trajectory here for, say, RCP 8.5, that uh, continuing to increase emissions scenario, is towards end Permian kinds of CO2 levels within a couple of hundred years. Um, so in some ways, maybe something like the end Permian gives us a geo geological analog for uh, future Earth. And for just to understand why that's kind of a sobering thought, this is what um, the end Permian oceans looked like before the mass extinction. So pretty flourishing places, um, lots of corals, maybe some nautiloids, but nice, a nice place to live. Uh, and then this is what you could imagine them looking like afterwards. So a place dominated by microbial mats, not just for a, a few years, but probably for several million years after this event. <coughs> uh, maybe some of you have seen images like this of coral bleaching, which lead people to ask questions like, well, is, are we in the early stages of a mass extinction? Doug Irwin thinks not, but I, I do think it's a fair question. Um, Tony Barnowski tried to crunch the numbers on this. This is a paper he wrote in 2011. Um, and what this shows, the white symbols, that's where we are in the present day um, in terms of how many things have gone extinct for different groups. Black is if you count things that are threatened or endangered. And so really the, the point is right now we are not in a mass extinction. If you were to include, if all of the things that are in black were to go extinct within, by the end of the century, and then you continued that pace uh, unabated, then you would arrive at this black line, which is the mass extinction level, the big five level, um, within around 200 to 500 years. So uh, I guess a few different ways of looking at it. Uh, if we get to a mass extinction, it would be much worse than where we are now. Uh, we are not there yet. We also know about how much time we might have. It's a few generations. Um, so uh, I think there's, you know, we can do something. Um, the last, the final thought that I'll leave you with um, is that maybe potentially we can consider 
uh, I'm just trying to connect this all the way back to some other interests that might be in this room. Maybe we can consider uh, carbon and sulfur emissions during something like the Siberian Traps as a kind of uh, feasibility study for uh, sulfur aerosol geoengineering. And I will, I'll leave it to all of you to draw your own conclusions uh, about what, if that were the case, what that would mean in terms of feasibility. Um, so that's, that's it. I'll leave this up because it is, I think, one of the more complicated figures and just hope to take your questions. Thanks. Thanks. We have questions. Let's use the microphone so Anya Schmidt can hear us. Hmm. And anyone else online? We had a lot of questions during the talk. <laughs> How did you get photographs of the ocean during the permit? Yeah, I was hoping somebody. Would, I always want somebody. I noticed to they were black and white, so that was. Uh, yeah, so they were old. <laughs> yeah, old photos. Um, so those. This is actually uh, there's this artist um, Hiroshi Sugimoto, and he goes around taking photos of dioramas and different natural history museums. Mm. So this is uh, a photo by Hiroshi Sugimoto of the latest Permian diorama at the American Museum of Natural History. Cool. So the, the ocean circulation change is really yeah. interesting. And I wonder if you've looked at whether or not the potential reason could be changes in the, uh, s the southern annular mode and the northern annular mode. Um, both of which, you know, have been reported following even the kind of eruptions we've seen, um, you know, influencing the wind stress and in turn. And, and of course, you could imagine that you'd have to have stratospheric engagement, you know, yeah. for something like that to happen. Yeah. So yeah. does your model have fully interactive radiation and the whole... Well, the whole interactive process that would be necessary to consider that. Yeah, thanks. I, mean, you could, I guess you could just look at the winds and yeah. see what happened. Yeah, so I think that would be uh, the first. I've not looked at the winds, but I was, I was basically wondering about that, and someone suggested that I look at that. So I've been trying to think about how those large changes could relate both to the background state and... Um, the different uh, circulatory modes, but I'm, I don't know yet the answer to that. Okay, so one thing I have <clears throat> never understood clearly is um, with all of the environmental changes following one of these episodes of uh, um, extremely large lava flows and increases in CO2 and so on. What exactly is the uh, kill mechanism that will explain uh, uh, the, for the end Permian the loss of 95% uh, of all species as has been estimated? So um, for the um, for the end Cretaceous, the KPG extinction, uh, you probably know from talking to Chuck, we did uh, uh, a simulation. And we showed that just the effects of the asteroids were sufficient to explain mm -hmm. first the land extinctions because of uh, global fires and general broiling, and then the oceanic ex extinctions because of the uh, prolonged period of darkness shutting down their primary productivity. So how would these things work for something like the uh, Empermian, which was even a more pervasive uh, extinction? Yeah, so if I think your question is, what is the mechanism that can viably get you from right. volcanism right. to mass extinction. From, from what you have seen yes. has changed. Yes. Um, yeah. So I think that is a great question. I absolutely do not have the answer to that. I think it's the question that we should be asking. And I do have an incredibly complicated figure in which I try and figure okay. that out, if you'd like to see it. OK. Um, Okay. A, so, <laughs> a quick question before you go through this: Are you going to yeah. be here tomorrow, or yeah. Yeah, I'll be here because tomorrow. I have to leave in five minutes? Yeah, but it would but be I great would to, to talk. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So all the rest of you, let's let's. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Yeah, well, so I, I tend to think that you have to invoke multiple mechanisms, and it may not be the same from uh, flood basalt to flood basalt. And I would not necessarily say that you have to invoke any of these things for the end Cretaceous. Um, so I think w one thing that's pretty clear is that different kinds of these eruptions have different consequences. There are some that seem to have not much negligible effects uh, overall. So uh, I think there's probably different things happening on land uh, and in the ocean. It seems like warming is playing a really important role. And if that warming is driven by CO2, also ocean acidification. Um, so changes in conditions in the ocean. Um, but on land, I think you could have some sort of symphony of things. So if Anya's listening, she suggested um, that acid mist could potentially play a role if eruptions were really sustained. Uh, but if you also have ozone depletion and changes in uh, atmospheric composition and uh, strong warming and these swings in precipitation, the one thing that really I think seems clear is that it was not a steady series of changes that you had. It was very punctuated. And so I think that's a real source of stress as well. So it's not just the absolute values of these stress, but how you're changing through time. Um, yeah. Thanks. <laughs>